Hello, everybody. Let's talk about entropy some more. And in fact, we're going to talk about my favorite part of entropy, the only way I think entropy really makes sense. We're going to talk about microentropy. And then we're going to do another macro entropy example. So there's two problems today. One, a little bit fluffy, a little bit fun, but hopefully is an illustrative example for you. And then the second one is going to get down and dirty with turbines again. So what do I mean when I talk about micro entropy? Well, entropy is a thing that we can think about kind of on two scales. One is the first scale on which it was discovered uh, when it was found by the people who were working on making engines that they could never get all of the energy they put in as heat to come out as work. The other form of entropy that underlies this, that is the fundamental truth, is at the micro scale. It's about what molecules and atoms are actually doing. So we're going to do an example on that and see how it translates to the larger scale. And for this example, I'd like you to get a six-sided die. Uh, if you don't have a huge collection of games like I do, uh, perhaps you can borrow one from somebody, use a simulated one, or you can just flip a coin. But the example works a little less well. And we're going to play this game called Liar's Dice. So uh, if we were all in the classroom and it was okay for everybody to touch stuff and pass it around, um, everyone would get uh, a couple of dice to use during this game. And Liar's Dice, usually you start with uh, five dice, everyone in the group. Uh, but for purposes of this illustration, let's say every single person in our class has one die. And so that means, um, including me, we'd have this time around uh, 24 people rolling dice. Okay, so each of these 24 people are going to roll one six-sided die. Okay, I'm rolling my dice, and I have a number. Now, liar's dice, you keep the number you roll secret from everybody, but you are betting on the number of dice that show a certain value in the entire room. Okay, so here's how the betting rules work. Uh, one, you have this roll and you've kept it secret. Two, when it is your turn to bet, you are either going to raise the bet or you're going to call. To raise the bet, you listen to what the people before you said, and either you have to bet a higher value on the dice. So if the last person bet a five, you would have to bet a six. Uh, or you may change the value or not change the value, and you have to bet a larger number of dice are showing that value. So if someone, if the person in front of me bet that there are three fives in the room, I could say there are three sixes, or if I wanted to say there are three twos, I can't say three twos, I'd have to say four twos. So that's how this goes. So we go all the way around the room until somebody decides the bet is so preposterous, like they don't believe it's true, and they call. And at that point, either that person loses because the person who bet was correct, or the person who bet loses because they lied. That's the liar's dice. So my question to you on this is we're playing this imaginary game. You know, do a few rolls, maybe do a little background math. Um, and I want you to think, what is a good bet? What are some things that are good bets, like reasonable, like you don't think you're going to lose if you bet? And then what's a completely preposterous bet? What is a bet that makes no sense to place at all? Or what are a few of those? And uh, look into those and look into the math of those and we're going to come into class and we're going to we're going to talk about that uh, and that's how we're going to work this through because uh, it turns out this is fundamentally a pretty reasonable model of why it is that not a hundred percent of your heat can turn into work let's talk about our second entropy related problem of the day for today and this is a Super practical example, uh, very uh, mathy, using a turbine. So let's imagine we have a steam turbine. There it is. And uh, so we're going to use the steam tables here. And it has steam coming into it at very high pressure and temperature. It's going to be at 8 megapascals, which is a super high pressure, and 500 degrees C, which is, I think you will uh, admit, a very high temperature. Oh, also, forgot to mention, its overall capacity is 60 kilowatts. 
hold that thought. You don't need to use that for a while yet. So just note that somewhere and leave it alone. Concentrate on the entering temperature and pressure, as I said, uh, 8 megapascals, 500 degrees C. And then the steam discharges, it comes out the other end of this turbine at uh, 0.1 megapascal, so about atmospheric. Uh, in real life, a turbine like this would not be a single unit. It would probably be several turbines uh, in series because this is a huge uh, pressure change. Um, if this turbine is 80% efficient, uh, I want to know the full description of the conditions of the outlet steam and also what steam flow rate needs to go through this in order for us to get to that 60 kilowatts. So this seems like a big problem, and it also seems like you have uh, more unknowns than you have equations. And this is because we are pivoting from relying on energy balances only to how the world actually works, which is energy balances plus entropy balances. Uh, and so we're gonna use a lot of information here, a little of it new, right? So we know inlet conditions, we only know part of the outlet conditions. So we, one unknown is we don't know the outlet temperature. Another unknown is, well, we, we don't know um, what's happening with the energy here. We don't know the flow rate, what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to give you a hint to start. This is our push to start, and then we'll be able to work on the rest of this together in class or on your own if that's what you're doing. So your energy balance is a typical turbine energy balance. We have no reason to believe there's a Q term here. So it's uh, delta H equals work. And you'll notice... Um, I'm writing it both intensive and extensive today. Uh, and that's because we're, we're gonna solve most of our stuff in the realm of delta H equals WS, independent of system size. But then to get to the number of uh, kilowatts, we're gonna have to bring in system size, but that's the very last thing we're gonna do. Okay, also we're gonna need an entropy balance. So I'm writing entropy balance as two different things, version one that we're gonna apply first and then version two. Uh, version one is delta S equals zero. That is, that should set off alarm bells for you. Like how the heck did we get to delta S equals zero? So really take a moment and reflect where's, where's the other terms that ought to be here that I'm saying delta S equals zero. And note it could be M dot times delta S equals zero. But again, we're gonna work size independent to begin with. The second time through on entropy, in a few minutes, we will apply the efficiency to account for the fact that delta S is not in fact honestly zero. So you're definitely going to want to have done the reading for this. Go back, look through the book, see how the book handles this sort of thing. Um, you're going to want to be in class and we will talk through solving this. And you're going to feel really accomplished when you do, because it seems like you don't know enough to do this, but trust me, you do. All right. See you in a minute.